What a mighty blessing it is to be here at the King's Church and also to be videoed by my good friend, Humble is the Way. We are always grateful for this ministry. We want you to enjoy it because it's blessing people all over the country. And so I want you to know that this video was uploaded by Humble is the Way. God bless you and we'll see you soon. You know, these fellas are absolutely crazy. <laughs> You know, they up there singing, they pointing to me like they wanted me to take over the song. I must start out smoking something before I got here. Praise Jesus. <laughs> it is certainly a pleasure to be here tonight and grateful for the King's Church of Christ worship experience. Uh, it is an experience when you come to this place and we're thankful to God for this environment of praise. Um, it's not always permissible everywhere to have this environment of praise. But we're grateful for uh, the freedom uh, of the King's Church in expressing their adoration for Almighty God. Also grateful, of course, to once again, Brother David Wilson, the great visionary of this congregation, he is certainly yeah. somebody's preacher. Great local work. He has a great national ministry. And beyond all of that, I'm grateful that he's my friend. And for that, I'm just grateful to, uh, to know him and to witness the great things God is doing with him. Uh, all great to see this wonderful crowd on a Monday night. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we're just thankful to God for your presence. It's good to see my father in the ministry, our brother Cornelius Haywood. Yes, uh, we're grateful for his ministry and thankful for his deposit into my life. Would not be a Christian had it not been for him and his deposit and teaching me the fundamentals of the faith. We're just grateful anytime. Of course, I saw him yesterday. I went to the house to try to eat some. And uh, it was just good to see him. Good to see my cousins back there, Josiah Hayward and Sierra with her fiance. She is fitting to get married and had the audacity to ask me to do the wedding. Praise Jesus. Uh, but it's just good to see my little cousin. Uh, about to tie the knot, and uh, I'm still trying to embrace that. Wonderful fellow, he, he good people, but, I, but I'm struggling because he's my little cousin. Uh, but it's just good to see him here tonight, and good to see Brother Maxwell. I have not seen him in so long, uh, but he doesn't age, man. I mean, he just look good. He just look good. Sound the same, still vibrant. It is just good to see him and all that came with him and thankful to see one of my mothers in the person of Sister Duncan tonight. Yeah. Um, uh, emotions erupt just looking at her yes, sir. because that is uh, her late husband is was my martial arts teacher and for many years, starting at the age of seven, he was my teacher uh, for 17 years. And like a father who to, under whom I was raised. And um, of course we lost him some years ago, but his legacy Amen. in the United States and in the world uh, will never be forgotten. One of the greatest martial artist that ever walked the face of this earth and is a significant fixture in black history and we are thankful for all that he has done and so it's just good to see mom of course because of him if somebody don't like what i preach i don't worry about it because you mess around and fool with me i'll pull out a different sword put these hands on you. I do lay hands. Praise Jesus. But it's just, <laughs> uh, I had to make that light because I was getting teary out of here. I had to crack a joke or something. So it's just good to see her. And just all of you. It's good to see Chris Turner and just everybody. I, I, don't, I can't mention everybody's name, but uh, I just love, just, y'all know I'm from here. 
So it's just good to see everybody. Good to see brother and sister Hamilton. Uh, my best friend's parents. It's just good to see you all. And it's good to see everybody. That's it. I'm almost done. Now, if you turn to the book of Esther, and the chapter is four, I'm going to ask you to meet me in verse number 14. Well, I'll begin reading for contextual sensitivity. I'll begin reading about verse number seven. That is the book of Esther. The chapter is four. Of course, back in the day, you know, if you have a paper Bible, it, it took some time to find that. Yes. 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 I like finding Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you have trouble, we used to tell folk, go to the table of content and look it up. But if, but if you have these electronic devices, you got there rather quickly. Amen. Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Hathach came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and ordered him to reply to Mordecai and all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that they may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. I want you for a few moments lift for a subject seeing the hand of God. Seeing the hand of God. I want to uh, be sure that you understand I am here to preach the word of God to everybody but I am specifically here to say a word to the King's Church of Christ about where you are currently in your history and what God is doing through you and what God is doing for you. And on tonight I want to uh, talk to you about the hand of Almighty God. It is dangerous for a child of God not to have the ability to see the hand of God lest you give credit to chance rather than the power of God. In other words, you need to understand some things or nothing happens by accident or by happenstance. But the Christian has to look through faith lenses and see that had it not been for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be? In other words, you have to know that nothing is 
is left to happenstance and nothing is left to a by accident theology. But you have to be careful to understand the Christian understands and should know that it is the hand of God that is working throughout the history of God's people. Now that means history is not circular, but history is linear. That simply suggests that God has us moving in a specific direction. And you have to be clear to understand that God's hand is moving in such a way to ensure that his people reach their destination. Now when I use the phrase hand of God, hand of God I'm using metaphorically as a phrase that suggests God's providence and God's power. Now that phrase, hand of God, is used several times in scripture, uh, specifically in the book of Nehemiah, uh, but it's used to describe the providence of Almighty God. Now let me help you understand what I mean by providence. By providence, I simply mean that God has the ability to provide beforehand what you need in order to fulfill God's purpose. God provides beforehand. Now, providence comes from a Latin term, providentia, which simply suggests that God can provide because he has foresight. Now, because God has foresight, he can see the problem before the problem takes place. God can provide an answer before you ask the question. And God will have a solution before you get to the crisis. Because God has foreknowledge and he has foresight, which means nothing catches God off God. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So you have to understand what surprised you didn't surprise God. Because God has foresight, foreknowledge, and it all relates to his providentia, his providence, which suggests that God, before a thing happens, can provide. Now, to be more specific, uh, God can work uh, in two ways, and sometimes it overlaps. Uh, God, we've seen work miraculously, which means God can work outside of natural circumstance. That's when he's working miraculously. That is, God can work in a way that is not limited to natural law. And we've seen God do that all through scripture, where he can work miraculously. But the same God has the power not only to work outside of natural circumstance, my God can work within natural circumstance. Oh, my, God, help me along there. my God can work within natural law and he can make this work with that and make that work with this. Now if you needed to see that biblically, I read somewhere that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. All things work is a Greek term, synageo, from which we get the English word synergy, which simply means God can make this and that work in harmony. Now let me give you a Bible example. You remember when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, and, uh, and right at the time he was about to sacrifice Isaac, it just so happened that a ram was walking by and got caught in the thicket. It just so happened that he got caught in the thicket at the same time frame that Isaac was about to get killed. It just so happened that God stopped the hand of Abraham and said there's a ram in the thicket and because that was happening and this 
the God of providence in which he can make all things sin our game or, or work in sin. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, now, how did you understand that? I want to show you that in Esther. Yes. Uh, now, the book of Esther, um, the book of Esther, yeah, come on, uh, I hope you read it because I can't preach the whole book. <laughs> um, but, but the book of Esther, happening at the time while Israel was under the rule of the Persian Empire. Uh, this is uh, chronologically and historically sometime between the first release under Zerubbabel and the second release under Ezra when they were moving back into their homeland. While they are under this particular regime, under a king by the name of Ahasuerus, and he is identified historically as the one we call Xerxes the first. So now, Ahasuerus was a, the king at this time, and while he's king at this time, there is a dispute or a tension that happens between a man named Mordecai and a man named Haman. Now, Haman was the right hand to the king, but he was, he was arrogant and he was lifted with power. There was a time when Haman saw Mordecai and because Mordecai refused to bow down to him, he got upset with Mordecai because Mordecai was supposed to show him some respect. But Mordecai, because he's a Jew, refused to bow down to anybody except God. Now when he refused to bow down, Haman put a plan in place to kill Mordecai and all of the Jews. Because Haman says, you ain't fit to disrespect me and get away with it. So he said, I want to be clear that not only am I going to kill Mordecai, I'm going to wipe out all of his descendants. So now you need to put that in redemptive perspective. If if Haman is successful, not only will he kill Mordecai, not only will he kill Israel, but he will kill every promise that God has made to bring forth the Messiah. You remember that God told Abraham, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God told Isaac, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God told Jacob, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God said in reference to Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Neither will Lord give up from between his feet until Shiloh come. All of those promises will die if Haman is successful in wiping out Israel. Now let me help you with that. God is loyal to his purpose. And when, because God is loyal to his purpose, he undergirds purpose with providence. Yeah, did you hear what I said? God is loyal to his purpose. And he undergirds purpose with providence. Now, that means if God's people want to be successful, then God's people must function in God's purpose so they'll benefit from his providence. Are you saying that? Every church all of God's people must be purpose driven in harmony with the will of God. Now if you are purpose driven in the harmony with God's will, then you can go to sleep because you can trust God's providence. Are you following what I'm saying? So now what you have is you have God's people about to go extinct. Now if they go extinct, there is no Messiah. There ain't no Jesus. There'll be no salvation. There will be no, there'll be no hope. There will be no resurrection. All of that goes out of the window if heaven is successful. Do y'all see the problem here? Uh, this problem is a lot bigger than just Mordecai dying. If Mordecai dies and the people of God die, every promise of salvation dies with them. What is God going to do? Since you got this tension between Hammer and Mordecai, there's a woman <laughs> happens to be Mordecai's cousin. Her name is Ahadasa, but her Persian name is Esther. 
Now, Esther yeah. and Mordecai have a conversation right. through a message. Uh -huh. Because Mordecai understands that we are about to go extinct. <laughs> now, Esther so happens to now be the king's wife. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to show you how she got there in just a minute. Uh, but this is the king's wife. Mordecai now sends a message to his cousin and said, look, the law, the edict has gone forward. We are about to be destroyed. She said, look, I can't go to the king now. It's been 30 days. And if anybody goes to the king uninvited, they are put to death. Well, Mordecai said, well, you send her a message back. Don't you think because you're in that palace yeah. All right. yeah. that you will escape the extermination of the Jews? And then he says, now I want you to be clear that I know you're in the palace now, but if you keep sight, stay with me. If you decide not to work for God's purpose and you don't say something, just know that my God is so powerful that he'll bring deliverance from another place. Now let me help somebody with that. Don't confuse God using you with God needing you. Y'all not going to help me at all. I think you need to understand. Don't confuse God using you with God needing you because if you fool with God, he'll get rid of you and raise up somebody else. So don't get arrogant about God using you because my God does not need you. Now that means God's power can be depended on. It's your privilege to serve him. Oh God, I wish I had somebody. I wish I had a few humble folk that would say I thank God that he uses me in spite of me. God uses me and it's my privilege not necessity. Don't you fool with God. God will remind you that he don't need you. He was here before you got here. He's going to be here after you leave. He's the Alpha and the Omega. God is omniscient, omnipresent. If you push God, he'll show you how much he don't need you. Now, so, so, so Mark, I said, now, now he'll bring deliverance from another place. But then he says, but who knows? Whether you have gotten royalty for such a time. Yes. Oh God, yes. as this, it just might be that God raised you up and positioned you for such a Now watch this. The such a time was the extermination of the Jews. But God had already positioned her before the time ever got around. God will often position you before you even know why you there. Are you following what I'm saying? Now watch this. How did she get there? How did she get there? How did she get there? Turn to, turn to Esther 2. Esther chapter 2. I'm almost done. <laughs> Esther, the second chapter. Y'all said this, this is so fascinating. If you've never read the book of Esther, you need to read it. By the way, most scholars... Uh, or many scholars question whether the book of Esther should belong to the canonicity of scripture because God's name is never mentioned. But if you just read it, God is on every page. Because while his name is not mentioned, his activity is clear. Are you following what I'm saying? Now watch this. Y'all in chapter 2? Alright, get, get in chapter 2. Uh, and I want you to start with me. Uh, let me just make sure you get the background. Now, when you get to chapter 1, uh, the king is having a 180-day banquet yeah, yeah. because he's just as pompous as he can be. 180-day celebration. And at the time, he's married to a woman named Vesta. Now, Vesta, the Bible says, was beautiful, and the king wanted to show her off. So he summoned Vesta. Vesta would not come at his summons. She was embarrassing his authority. 
and the king and his subjects were nervous that if they see this woman acting that way without consequence, then it might cause the other women to act just like her. They made a move that that side don't need to be queen no more. All right. Now, oh, what a sad situation. But, but where do you see God's hand? God is about to remove somebody so he can make room for the one he needs in the position. Yeah, yeah. Are y'all following that? Yeah. Now watch this. Now watch how this works. Now, now look at verse number one of chapter two. Right. After these things, when the king, when the anger of the king, Ohasuerus, was subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel and Susa to the harem into the custody of a guy, the king's unit, who is the charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given to them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in the place of Vesta. Y'all watching God's hand? All right, now watch this. Drop down to verse number seven. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful, a form and face. Now the Holy Spirit, the third member of the God here, who wrote the sacred text, wanted you to be very clear about her inherent gifts. I, I can't. You to be clear yeah. that she was not just fine in face, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but depending on which angle you look, she, y'all know what I'm saying? She was, she was that. Uh, Beyonce had nothing on Esther. Uh, uh, Nicki Minaj should go sit down somewhere. She's beautiful in face. So if you looked at her face, you was moved. And if you looked anywhere else, you was moved. Thank God I'm gonna help me. Why y'all acting like that? This is in your Bible. You acting like I put it in there. Y'all not helping. I, I'm wrong. All right, look at this. <laughs> look at what it So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susan in the custody of a guy that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of a guy who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor. Now let me help you. God can use anything he wants to providentially position who he needs. So Esther, when she was born, had no idea that her fineness, y'all not gonna hit me long, her fineness was not for her to find a man, but it was to rescue Israel from getting killed. Y'all not hearing me. God can use anything he wants to use, and her fineness would be her edge to be providential positioned by God for his purpose. When the king saw Esther, he said, oh my God. The way you say it in the African American, oh God. What is God doing? God, you're positioning her for the purpose for which he has. Now this is not God working miraculously. This is God working Providentially within natural circumstances. Are y'all seeing that? Come here, come here. Now, two things are going to happen. I'm done. Two things are going to happen. Yeah. Esther, number one, is going to be positioned as queen. Yeah. Yeah. That, and God's going to do that before the edict comes for them to be terminated. Because God, providence means God did it beforehand. So God positions her before the problem occurs so that when the problem occurs, the solution's already in place. That's the kind of God we serve. 
Are you following? I'm going somewhere with this king. Stay with me. Because you need to understand that it's not by accident that now you are able to move forward with your project. God already had a solution in place before you knew the solution was even there. Because God was already positioning people in the right place at the right time so that when your need arose, God was able to make your project move forward. That's not by accident. That's not by happenstance. The hand of God. Now, here's what's wrong with Christians. We don't know how to celebrate God because we can't see his hand. And until you start seeing his hand, you ain't going to know when to celebrate. So you got to learn when to shout when I praise God. David took me over to the spot. I walked in there. I was like, wow. Oh, my God. They already built in the stage. And I saw where everything's going to be. I even saw where I was going to preach when I come back. I, I saw everything. And I said, oh, yeah. I was shouting in there already. Not shouting just over the building, but shouting because God showed his hand and his providence and his power showed up right when kings needed it most. That's not an accident. That's God's providence. And folk got to know how to shout and say thank you, Jesus, not just over the house and not just over your money, but thank you, God, for doing what you needed to do for the people of God to move forward in our purpose. Now watch this. Two things happen in Esther. One, she gets position. Watch this. The sending of is Mordecai saves the king's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two things happen that's going to save Israel. And both of them happen within natural circumstances. Yeah. All right, y'all got Esther's position. Now stay in chapter 2. I want you to come down now to verse 21. Chapter 2. Verse 21. I said two things happen. Stay with me, Bible students. Two things happen. Esther, she gets positioned as queen. She's powerful. And she's got a whole lot of influence with the king because she's fine. Let's yeah, stop, y'all. I mean, all right, I won't say it all. She, she's, she's attractive. Is that better? She's attractive? All right. She, she's attractive. Listen, don't be mad at that, y'all. Y'all, some of y'all sisters looking real funny right now. Stop looking funny. Don't be, don't hate her. Don't you drink no hate her. She, she was fine. According to the Holy Spirit. That's book chapter. She's got extreme influence. Now watch this. 21. In those days. Wait, I love how historical narratives read. It's like a story. It's a movie. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bithan and Terrence, two of the king's officials, from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Hohasuerus. But the plot became known to Mordecai. And he told his cousin who just so happens to be queen, who just so happens to have influence with the king. Tells her what happened. Esther informed the king of Mordecai's name. Now when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on gallows and it was written, underline it, in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. Stop, Rex, hold it right there. Two things happen. Esther becomes queen. Mordecai saves the king's life and tells his cousin so she can save the king. Yeah. Now time lasts. Yeah. Hannah becomes in the right hand of the king. Uh. Hannah don't like Mordecai. Okay. Hannah wants Mordecai to die. It got so bad that he told Esther, you been, I think you may have been raised up for a time such as this. So she decides she will go tell the king she will plan two banquets yeah, yeah. so she can eventually tell the king what's going on. She knew how to get right with him. She knew not only was she beautiful, she was wise. Yeah. And she said, I'm going to cook him some good food. I'm going to invite him to a wonderful banquet. And he said, what do you want? Yeah. While that's going on, watch this. Helen, it's trying to kill Mordecai. Yeah, yeah. Turn to chapter chapter six. Chapter five. Chapter five. Chapter five. I want you to get me down into verse 14. Hammond is ready to kill Mordecai. Can't stand it. Watch this. Y'all y'all ready? Then Zerus' wife and all his friends said to him, Have gallows 50 cubits high, made and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on him. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. That's Esther's banquet. And 
the advice please Hammond. So he had Gallows made. Chapter 6. Charring that night. The king couldn't sleep. Boy, I feel like preaching this. King got to a place where he woke up in the middle of the night. Watch what he does. He gave order since he was up. Bring me the book of the Chronicles. That's the book where Mordecai was recorded as saving the king's life. But the king don't know who he is. So it just so happened that he couldn't sleep that night. Pull the book of the Chronicles. Watch what happens. It was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Bitha and Turk and Tertia, two of the Edens who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. The king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai? I now have read what happened. Now I know who he is. Tell me, what should I do? Guess who he's going to ask? about you, it was about God's purpose. 
purpose. And if you're here, you need to know providence is a real doctrine. That you can see all through scripture. Yeah. yeah. But God's people don't celebrate God because mm. you can't see his hand. Yeah. So when you should praise him yeah. for what he's done, you too busy giving all the wrong stuff credit. Yeah. Uh, hey, right there, right there, right there. You give everything, you give your degree credit. Yeah. You gave your money credit. Yeah. You give everything credit for what God has done. God is saying, when you see my name. Are you following it? Now, 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 Cain's for Cain. That's for Cain. When I walked through the building, I saw the hand of God working for his purpose to take over Brooklyn. I saw one sight, but then God in my mind showed me some more sights. Because you want to saturate Brooklyn with God's purpose. Well, what's the purpose, Haywood? Because yeah. some folks don't know what that is. Yeah. God's purpose yeah. is for you to encounter somebody yeah. to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ yeah. and to expand his borders. Yeah. And you do that by any means necessary. Yeah. Are you following what I'm saying? And you gotta get to a place change where you don't care what nobody think about. Amen. Y'all yeah, not gonna hear me long, man. That's all. Amen. You gotta get to a place because uh, praise Jesus, some folks will start tripping and saying, why? And I don't know. And, and why they doing all that? If you listen to the why and the I don't know, you will let the brotherhood put you in shackles and in handcuffs. And why and meanwhile, Brooklyn folk has chose a diet, folk are not meeting Jesus Christ, while you worried about what everybody else thinks. Stop worrying about the brotherhood and start putting a sight here and a sight there and a sight there and saturate. That's what, you, that's what you got to do. Because it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody knows your situation better than you. And so you got to understand God's hand is in what you're doing. Because it's about the purpose of Almighty God. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're here tonight, if you're here tonight and you are not a Christian, we believe in the purpose of God. And if you need to know what that is, I quoted Romans 8 28. Might as well quote the rest of it so you know what his purpose is. His purpose is whom he did foreknow. Yeah. He did predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear son. That he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Right. Jesus want, or rather God wants Jesus to have a whole lot of little brothers. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the normal way of saying it. I know it sounds lofty in scripture. God wants Jesus to have little brothers that look like him. Yeah. Yeah. Even not just outwardly, but inwardly. That is, that they might be, the, or rather that he might be the firstborn or the supreme one among many brothers. Yeah. How are you going to do it, God? For whom he did for no, he predestined. Who he predestined, he called. Who he called, he justified. And who he justified, he's going to glorify. That's God's purpose. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. What are we doing? We try to give Jesus some little brothers. Yeah. Because when you come against somebody that you can't handle, well, yeah. then you need to have a big brother to call. Yeah. Back in the day, I told us back in the day, I was a trash talker. This is before Sensei got a hold of me, my brother. Uh, I believed I could whoop anybody. But that just, I just knew how to talk a good game. Praise God. And there was some folk planning. They said, I tell you what, when we get you by yourself, we're going to see all of that stuff you be talking. And one day I said, you know, look, ain't no problem. You feeling froggy, jump. And then, yeah, that's how I talk about you. You want some, come get some. When I went outside, out, out, out of school, six of them was waiting for me. Nice. But some of you don't know, I have a brother. His name is Ronald. And back then, he was a bodybuilder. He went to the same school I went to. But they had me by myself. And they knew right now they could get a hold of me. So I said, look, it's just me by myself. What y'all want to do? And they started advancing toward me. And the closer they got, they stopped. And they started 
started backing up. And they said, no, nah, we don't need to do this right now. I said, what you backing up for? What's the problem? What I didn't know was that my brother showed up behind me. Didn't announce that he was there. But his presence made everybody start moving back. Because they said we could handle Hayward, but the dude behind it, we're not able to deal with. I've come today to tell somebody when the devil shows up for battle and it's time for him to get you. I've come today to tell you, you need to stand flat for the firm because your big brother knows how to show up at the right time. And when Jesus shows up, he'll fight that battle for you. And I don't know if you're here today. You need a big brother. And the way you get your big brother is by obeying the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Yeah. And if you're here and you obey that gospel, trust in the cross and get baptized and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. God will add you to the body of Christ. And when you get in the body of Christ, you then can say, I'm justified. But then you also know I'm a benefit from God's providence. And if you're here today, I want you to get ready to come. Yeah. God is going to bless you right now if you say yes to Jesus. Let's all stand together.